So the plan, you like to know the plan? Mm -hmm. I like I like the plan. I like to know the plan. I'm not quite as detailed as Don Shade. <laughs> when Don Shade goes on vacation, he knows every Chick-fil-A <laughs> and every uh, Quaker Steak and Lou that he's going to stop at. Costco. And every get Costco gas station. I'm not quite that detailed. That's because you married me. Yep. <laughs> it's all about the adventure. The plan for Sunday mornings is the nine o'clock service, and we'll be preaching through the book of First and Second Timothy and Titus, possibly a few others, depending on how how um, things go. We'll move move on from there. And at the ten forty five hour, we will be in the book of Psalms. I may sprinkle in some proverbs once in a while. Think that's okay. Uh, since you don't get to dictate what I preach, that's okay. No. <laughs> I came to the realization that I have never preached through First Timothy. I've preached through Second Timothy. I've never preached through the book of First Timothy. I'm wrong. So we are going to uh, take a look at the book of First Timothy. Written, obviously, by Paul the Apostle, as it is stated in verse 1. Paul, it is believed, had been in prison in Rome, in his first Roman imprisonment, where he was chained between the guards. His second Roman imprisonment was in the Mamertine prison, which you can go to to this day if you want. It's a basically a cave with a hole in the roof, and he was lowered down through that hole in the dark and damp. He cried, he, he uh, asked for his cloak to be brought for the winter because it was cold. But this was between those two imprisonments. Paul writing to Timothy. He says. In his opening statement, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. It's not like Paul needed to remind Timothy that he was an apostle. But I think that Paul understood, by perhaps by the Holy Spirit, that this letter would go far beyond Timothy. And so Paul states his credentials at the beginning. <coughs> If I got a letter from an unknown person who told me that I had a serious disease, and they didn't tell me I'm a thoracic surgeon from, that studied at such and such of a, a medical school or what, whatever, they didn't give me their credentials, I probably wouldn't put much stock in the letter. Would you agree? However, Paul states clearly his credentials, he's an apostle, and he, he has this twofold authority. I want you to notice it in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus of Christ Jesus, by first the command of God our Savior. It's, it's a royal commission. And by the command of Jesus Christ our hope. I believe that God, our Savior here, is actually referring to the Father, and he's stating he is an apostle because of the Father and of the Son. And therefore, we should listen. We should pay attention to what he has to say. He, he states his credentials perhaps, as an encouragement. You see, Timothy was discouraged, tired. He was young. And it's easy for young men to get ran over by older men. <laughs> I, I, I can remember as a young pastor, Preaching about preaching about Jonah, 
in the way. And I said, it is not, I wasn't preaching, I was teaching a Sunday school class. And I said, well, probably when Jonah came out of the whale, he his skin was ashen white, he probably was hairless, because of the acidity in the stomach of that great fish. It would have done a number after three days on his body. And an older gentleman stood up, said, not true. God protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where they didn't even smell like smoke, so he protected Jonah. I was 20-something. And this guy was in his 60s and had been a Christian a long time, and he was plowing the earth. By the way, I, I'm right, he's wrong. The Bible nowhere says that Jonah was protected from that. In fact, the reaction of the Ninevites show that he probably had all of those and you can't say what God did in one place is not the same as what God can do in another place. Jonah's a good fish. Do, do you know how easy it is for a pastor to get discouraged? I do. Not only because there's been times in my life that I've been discouraged. But I grew up in a pastor's home. When I was young, I, I was I, I was very outgoing. There, 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 if you didn't know, I was never shy. Did you, anybody ever guess that? My kids are really shy. <laughs> and people used to ask me all the time, Tim, are you gonna when you grow up, are you gonna be a pastor just like your dad? And you know what my answer always was? No way. Uh-uh. In fact, when I went to college, to Cedar Hill College, it wasn't one of the great places called Lincoln Center. When I went to Cedar Hill College, I was a business major. I was studying accounting, taking business classes, and I hated it. I hated every minute of it. It was just terrible. And only through the <coughs> godly advice of some wonderful professors and friends did I realize what God had done in my life. But why didn't I want to be a pastor as a kid? Because you could tell what the pastor did. It was hard as pastor. I found the bad times, the discouragement, the heartache, the times when God's sheep unwittingly who shot arrows and drove knives through the heart of the earth. I, I'm not saying that to anyone in this room. I'm really not. But I will tell you right now, that's happened in my life. Where there has been knives and arrows. And Timothy needed a reminder of that this man that was talking to him was more than a mentor, more than a friend. He was an apostle. And he was there as an apostle to get behind Timothy. You know, it's great to know that you've got that guy. I write out with the police department. And I'll tell you, if you get into a bad situation, you're really glad there's somebody else there. Good to have capable backup. Timothy had Paul. Paul says to Timothy, my true son or my genuine son in the faith. Paul had led this young man to faith in Jesus Christ. Timothy was born to a Jewish mother and a Greek father. <clears throat> he had been raised by his mother and his grandmother Lois, knowing the holy scriptures of the Old Testament. And through the Apostle Paul came to know the God of the Scriptures in a personal way with Jesus. As Paul led him to genuine faith, and so Paul says to my true or genuine son, Timothy. Typical greeting from Paul. He says, grace, mercy, and peace through God the Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. These three correlate. Grace, okay, quiz time. I, I want some interaction. What is the, the definition of grace? Somebody give it to me. Any Anyone you, you've learned. Forgiveness for something you've done. Nope. Good try. That's mercy. That's mercy. Awesome. Forgiveness for something. Not getting what you deserve is mercy. We, what do we deserve for the wages of sin is death. Mercy. You don't have to pay the price because Jesus Christ did it for you. What's grace then, Lee? Getting what you don't deserve. Some people have used the acronym God's Riches at Christ's expense. The, the abundance of blessing when we have not earned it. I spoke yesterday at the funeral and said, Carmela did not deserve heaven. Neither did I. Neither did you. But the fact that by God's grace we receive heaven, that is grace. And if there's anything you've ever done to earn it, it ceases to be grace and now is wages. Every time you get a paycheck, those of you that are still active in the workforce, some of you aren't active yet, and some of you are retired. But every time you get a paycheck, it's because you did something to earn it, I hope. That's what it's about. You're supposed to earn your money. Amen? Oh, I didn't hear a very strong amen on that one. <clears throat> but if I come up and give you something that you did nothing for, that's my grace. And even more so if you've done bad things and hate me and I give you something nice. Right? Isn't that what the Bible says? We are we're enemies of God before salvation. And God graced us anyway. While you were yet sinners, Christ died, died for you. <coughs> he paid the price so you don't have to. Mercy. And then the last thing there is peace. And because of God's grace and mercy, we have peace with God. We're not talking about the peace that you, you get tranquil in the situation. We're talking about the cessation of hostility. Does anybody know what the word cessation means? To cease, to stop fighting. We're all worried right now. I hope if you're not, maybe you should be. But what's going on is between the U.S. and Iran. We should be worried about that. There's there's serious repercussions for what they're doing and what we're doing. I'm not I'm not saying, telling you that we've done anything wrong. In fact, I, I I'm of the opinion we've done it right. I think we need to. Do to deal with that situation. But I, I'm trying not to be political. But peace is when there is true cessation of hostilities. Am I getting too political tonight? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, too bad. Verse <clears throat> 3, Paul says, I urged you when I went to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus. His timing was when he left Ephesus for Macedonia. Between the two imprisonments, he needed someone to stay as his representative. Timothy was not the pastor of the church of Ephesus, according to uh, the, the uh, commentaries I've read. They had their own pastor elder bishops. Timothy was the apostolic representative. We don't have that anymore. You just got me. Uh, <laughs> Timothy represented Paul. And he was there to be an encouragement for the elder pastor bishops to continue down the right path, to be teaching correctly, and to help the people of the church of Ephesus. So Paul said, Timothy... Stay here. 
I need you here for now so that you can carry on my work while I go on. Paul was not a pastor of the church he started, the churches he started. He set up pastors. He was a unique position within the church that no longer exists. The apostles, as dictated in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, were ones that saw Christ and walked with Christ. The 11 plus Paul. Paul, an apostle like one out of time, spent three years in Arabia with Christ being taught. Called specifically to be the apostle to the Gentiles. To remain in Ephesus. And I have orders for you. Instruct certain people not to teach. This is uh, very similar to military orders. Commands. Give a, uh, a charge to these certain people. We don't know who they were. It doesn't say. Apparently, Timothy knew exactly who he was to be dealing with because these certain people were teaching false doctrine dealing with things that they shouldn't be dealing with. And so he said to <coughs> instruct certain people. To not teach. I, I, I had to look this up in the Greek. It's a double negative. Now, if you ask Mrs. Calvin <coughs> what a double negative is, she would tell you a double negative equals a, it's a positive. If you say, don't not, you're saying do. But not in Greek. In Greek, if they say don't not, or not not, it's not two negatives equal a positive. It's two negatives equal a bigger negative. The emphasis of the negative is very, very strong here. Teach them not not. This is imperative that you teach them to stop doing this now and don't do it anymore. <coughs> this double negative. Well, what were they teaching? He says, don't pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. <coughs> a myth, an invention, a fiction, a falsehood. Denote something without historical reality. Fanciful tales, such as that abound in rabbinical writings, a truth other than God's. Some people say that Genesis chapter 1 is a myth, a fable, something that was made up so that we would kind of understand created how the world came to exist, but really Science teaches us how the world came to be, and really the world came to be through a process of evolution that started with a big bang. Well, actually, the big bang didn't go all the way back. Did it? I can't remember. You can't keep up with the changes in in or the science of origins because it changes all the time. Why does it change all the time? Because they're just fixing things. They're making things. What has never changed since it was written? The word of God. The truth in the Word of God says, In the beginning, God created in six literal 24 hour days. That's what we believe. Don't pay attention to myths and fables, to things that are not consistent with the Word of God. And, and the idea of paying attention is to be addicted to. To, to, to be consumed by. I know people that are absolutely consumed by certain things. To the exclusion of almost everything else. And we must be very careful. 
that we do not get so tightly focused on one thing, especially if it's false, but even sometimes when we get so focused on one specific truth, we can ignore the rest. We need to be careful not to do that. We need to take the totality of God's word and study all of it. And I think we, that there is one thing we should be addicted to, and that's God's word. We should be addicted to learning about God and studying God. The second thing was was in endless genealogies. The, the, the idea of genealogies in the Old Testament, the rabbis wanted to trace their genealogy back to certain people to show that they're special or that they're accepted by God. It was clear in, in the Jewish people that you had to be Jewish to be really a part of God's people. And so they would be sure they knew their family genealogy. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is addicted to endless genealogy. Because they want to somehow prove who they will be in heaven and when they become God. If you don't know the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you need to study it. It's dangerous. I've been tinkering a little bit with genealogies of my family just because I'm curious. And it, it can get addictive. You can spend way too much time. Be careful. But what's your purpose? You, you see, the problem was that these detracted from understanding God's plan. They promoted empty speculations, he says in verse 4. In other words, things that have no substance and are just speculative. We're just making it up as we go. Rather than coming to an understanding of God's plan from his word. I, I think I've told you before, if I haven't, let me be very clear. My opinion doesn't matter. I need to know. I, I really don't care what your opinion is on a lot of issues. I care what the word of God says. I'm not trying to be mean or... or, or, or Flippant. I've, I've said a number of times that there was a bumper sticker that was popular back when bumper stickers were popular. That's a few years ago. <laughs> that said, God's word says it. I believe it. That settled it. There's a problem with that bumper sticker. <coughs> and that's the middle part. It's settled whether you believe it or not. God doesn't care whether you believe that what he said was sin. If he said it was sin, it's sin. He doesn't care whether you believe that when you die without Christ, you'll be in hell. It doesn't matter what your opinion is or what your belief is, except trust in Jesus Christ and save. That's what matters. That's following God's plan. That's getting into the Word of God. It's something that operates by faith. Not trying to find endless facts and geneal the genealogy of looking back into the past. We need to look at God's Word and God's plan. Now, should you misunderstand Paul, he's not trying to be mean. He's not being hateful. He says, in fact, the goal of our instruction is love, agape. Now, most of you have taught well. I'm going to quiz Richie since he's here. What is the definition of agape love, Richie? Doing what is best for the one love. 
It's not feeling good about another person. If you go by your feelings, they'll lead you down the wrong path almost every time. Not always, but a lot. In fact, if you start with your feelings, your feelings will deceive you because the heart where your feelings are seated is deceitful and desperately wicked, the Bible says. And guess what? Even if you're a believer here sitting today, your heart's still evil and desperately wicked. our goal is love. Doing actions what is best for the one love. Taking those actions that is in the interest of the other, not in my own interest. Putting the needs of somebody else before my own. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible never commands us to love ourselves. Did you know that? The, the, the world wants to make you think that. In fact, the Bible tells us that everybody loves themselves. No man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. You say, well, what about those that have uh, psychological problems? We, we can talk about that a long time. It, in the end, it's about loving yourself. We need to love others how we want to be loved. In fact, they teach that in school even today. Treat others how you want them to treat you. It's called the golden rule. Uh, somehow that biblical principle is hung on, even though they don't say it's from the Bible. It really is. Treat others how you want to be treated. Love others as you love yourself. Put their needs before your own. Somebody wants to get in front of you, you know, in the lane of traffic. Love them. If Lori's on the road, let her get in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody pushes in front of you at Walmart at the checkout stand, or they they the person comes to finally open the cabinet for you to get out whatever you were looking for, and you've been there for half an hour, and somebody steps in and asks them to do do theirs first. And they've only been there for five minutes. Let them. Show some love. Isn't that the world we live in? <laughs> oh. Agape love. Loving God, loving your neighbor from a pure heart. <clears throat> Unmixed, without contamination. Sometimes we put in, when we love others, what we want back. I'm doing this so that they'll do this. Right? Love from an unmixed, pure heart. For the good conscience, one that has been freed from the guilt of sin by the application of Christ's blood, according to Edmund Hibbert. A good conscience, one that is cleared from the consequences of sin, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done. From sincere faith, unfeigned, not hypocritical, not mere lip faith or mere pretense, but sincere trust and confidence in the heart. Again, according to That's how we're to treat people. That's how we're to love people. That's the goal of pushing people into God's plan. As we as we embark on these small group discipleship groups, the goal is out of love, of a sincere heart, to be directing people into God's word so that they can see God's plan. often we make our own plan and we say well this is my plan God can you put your stamp of approval on it
I've been off this whole time. Wow. He says, they want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what it's saying or what it's insisting on. Teaching out of false motives something that they don't even know. Turn it down a little bit. Thank you. They want to be teachers not because they have a good grasp and a good understanding and, and they have something to impart and they're, they're concerned that somebody else would know what they've, been, what they've learned. My, my friends, as you learn about God, as you learn from His Word, you should have a burning desire to share that with somebody else. Not because you want to be the important person that gets to teach, but because, wow, Look what I've learned about God. Look at what I can share with somebody else to bring them along with me. There was false motives here. They were teaching the law that they didn't understand, bringing down on the people condemnation. Teaching the law as evil. But Paul says, we know the law is good. They, they had failed. <coughs> they had turned aside from the goal of love. They desired to be teachers. And they needed to learn that the law was good. The law was good as long as you use it in the right way. The, the focus of the law is not on the righteous person, Paul says. We know the law is not meant for the righteous person, but for the lawless and rebellious. One who is righteous, interesting, the, the singular righteous person, who is already in right standing before God because they have come to the understanding of their sinfulness and have turned to Christ, therefore they've been declared righteous, the law no longer has a, a real purpose in his life because they have already dealt with the sin through Jesus Christ. The law is to bring people to that understanding. It's the schoolmaster. It's the one that brings us to an understanding of our sin. And he says, but for the lawless and rebellious. Interesting that the righteous person is in the singular and all of the rest is in the plural. And the purpose of the law is to bring to repentance. To bring us to an understanding that our righteousness will never, never attain to the level of God's. You ever talk to a person so many times where you ask them about their salvation? They well. I hope I've been good enough. I hope my good deeds have, have outweighed my bad deeds and you know that, that, that God will accept me because I've done enough good. What's the Bible say? All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. <laughs> here, King of Heaven, here, here's what I've got to bring. And it's soiled rags. I don't know if you can get the picture well enough, but they didn't have toilet paper in those days. Do I need to say anything more? And that's what you're offering to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We need to understand the filthiness that the law brings to mind. The law is for these groups of people, the lawless and rebellious. Lawless in the, in the Greek means disobedient, not subject to, insubordinate. Translated unruly in, first, in, in Titus chapter 1. 
They refer to opposers of the law to whom it is enacted. Rebellious is opposing. Lawless is acting like it doesn't apply. I'll tell you what, the, the longer I am with, as a chaplain with the police department, I understand there's people in this town that believe the law doesn't apply to them ever. And that those that are, that are called by God, by the way, to enforce the law should be resisted. There are people out there that are part of a group, oh, autonomous, no, that's not the right word. Um, what's the right word, Janae? Cit- the citizens. Um, sovereign citizens. That's the right word. Sovereign citizens who believe that they're not subject to the laws of our government. In the same sense, there are a lot of people that don't believe they're subject to the laws of God. And they don't believe there is a God, and they've done that so that they, can't, they don't have to answer to Him. They've erased creation so that there is no creator, because if there is no creator, there is no judge, and if there is no judge, they don't have to answer into eternity. The lawless and rebellious are ones that have rejected that they have to answer to anybody. The ungodly and sinners, he who does not reverence God, who openly sins against him, the opposers from uh, the opposers of God from, uh, from from which the law comes, the unholy and irreverent, the one who does not reverence God. That's the same. I, I copied the wrong one. The idea of of mocking. who God is, irreverence. People that commonly use God's name as a cuss word. There's quite the list here. He begins to list individual sins and the Ten Commandments come into play. Killers of parents. Now, now, I don't know whether he literally means people that kill their parents, or as Jesus said, to murder is the same as to hate. And we are called to honor our father and mother. And these are killers of parents, or ones that left their parents out to survive on their own. Murderers. The Bible says, don't kill. Sixth commandment. Fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Seventh commandment, don't commit adultery. It's interesting here, he he puts the sexually immoral and homosexuals in the same phrase. You see the, the construction of the sentence for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral and homosexuals, for kidnappers, liars, and perjurers. Sexual immorality, man stealers, uh, kidnappers. It was common in those days for people to take children and sell them on the slave market. We're not talking here about stealing, as in stealing your possessions, but stealing your children. You know, that's going on in our area. The, the trafficking in human, human beings. One of the worst areas in the country is the Sacramento, Sacramento area, which includes us. It wasn't that long ago, at least in my mind. The young boy, wearing almost nothing, climbed over a wall and went into the in-shape city right down the road here and asked for help, and the chains were still on him. He had been chained to the fireplace. 
for several years and finally escaped. Several people are in prison, as they should be. He, he finishes this, liars and perjurers, and, and anything contrary to sound doctrine. Those that can't speak the truth and those that aren't willing to, to stay within the Word of God. Contrary to the glorious gospel. People that, that aren't willing to go with what the Word of God says. I don't know if you read yesterday, but the United Methodist Church, which is historically very um, doctrinally liberal. In other words, they don't hold to sound doctrine. But they're now splitting into two different groups. A very progressive group and a little less progressive group. And the split is over whether to ordain clergy and to uh, allow for homosexual marriage. The whole of the United Methodist Church, which in the 1800s was probably a pretty good church, Today, I don't care what you found. Today is fighting over things that should not even be in question. The law is clear. And it's meant for those people that have been listed. To bring them to repentance and to an understanding of the violation of God's word. So that they may come on their knees asking for forgiveness. Because there is a true answer. He says that anything that is contrary to sound teaching, the sound teaching is based on the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was entrusted to me. What is the glorious gospel? The good news that Jesus Christ came as a baby in a manger, grew up living an absolutely perfect life as the God-man. We call that the incarnation. That's what you celebrated two weeks ago, right? The incarnation. That's what you were celebrating. God coming to earth, taking on a body so that he might die on the cross. And the Glorious gospel is that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again to pay the price for sinners. So all these things, all of these things are forgiven by the cross, by faith in Jesus Christ. The law brings us to an understanding of our need for that price to be paid. The law is good when it's used appropriately, when it's used in conjunction with the gospel. But when the law becomes an oppression on those that are already righteous, which is what these false teachers were doing, the law is bad. The law is faulty. We should not be bringing ourselves under legalism where we, like the Pharisees, take the laws of God and add to them our own rules and regulations. Rather, we should... Use the law the legitimate way. Teaching God's morality. God's judgment on those that violate his morality. And God's solution through the cross. You see that verse I quote, we quoted earlier, for the wages of sin is death, doesn't stop there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hold to sound doctrine. Don't get involved in myths and genealogies. Don't start misusing the Word of God and the law of God. Use it legitimately, he says to Timothy. Tell these people that think they're teachers that are doing these things incorrectly to stop, stop. 
to not not do it anymore. We need to be careful, and we are, at crossroads, what we teach and who teaches. But sometimes, you need to teach. You need to take what God's given you, and understanding it legitimately, you need to be the discipler. Be careful. Don't get involved in these things, because I'll tell you to stop. My name is Timothy, after all. We commit again in 2020 to continue to hold to sound doctrine, to believing and taking the Word of God for what it says. We practice, and if you don't know what this means, go look it up. We practice a literal hermeneutic. That's an uh, understanding of the scripture that is, as it is literally written, understanding the, the type of literature it is. We literally interpret the Psalms and the Proverbs for what they are. Proverbs are not promises. We'll talk a little bit about that another time. Psalms are, are singing, of, singing of praise. We're going to talk about the Psalms in, a, in just over half an hour. We're going to get into Psalm 1. I hope that you'll be able to stay. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you would help us to hold tight to the glorious gospel, to what you've taught us in the word of God, to not question it, to not, to not uh, explain it away by myth or legend, that we wouldn't get caught up in just one little thing. But Father, we would teach the entirety of the Scriptures. Help us to be your kind of church in this next decade. In Jesus' name, amen.